Good morning, everybody. Russ Barkley here with your weekly news roundup on new research. Sorry to be a few days late here. It was St. Patrick's Day over the weekend, and we were celebrating mightily here in Richmond. So uh, forgive the delay. Uh, as always, we're going to start out with your favorite dad joke. And this week, your dad joke is, I found a wooden shoe in my toilet. When I called the plumber over, he said it was clogged. <laughs> oh, man, shoot me. Okay, sorry about that one, but I thought it was pretty funny, actually. So uh, this week, we're going to talk about four studies, two of which deal with the results of some neuroimaging studies that might seem counterintuitive. Uh, but we're going to take a deep dive into it to show that that's not necessarily the case. So uh, the first study was published over in the American Journal of Psychiatry. This one actually showed up in some of the trade media during the week because it was a large study involving nearly 10,000 individuals, about 1,700 of which had ADHD. And it was looking at functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So looking at the functional connectivity of different regions in the brain in people with ADHD versus typical people. Uh, and it was especially focused on the central part of the brain known as the basal ganglia. We're going to talk about that in a second as well. Now, uh, important to understand here is that the people weren't engaged in any sort of task, uh, that this was a resting state study of functional MRI. The second study, which I'm going to review at the same time, was a study that was published over in Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences. It's also an fMRI study of functional connectivity in 300 individuals, and they looked at the extent to which they had ADHD symptoms, and they explored the functional connectivity of brain regions, actually rather similar to the first study. So uh, since this is technical, I'm going to uh, bring up some PowerPoints for you, uh, and let's just show you a little bit about the brain regions that we're talking about and why these findings are not so counterintuitive. So hang on while I get my PowerPoints up. Here we go. Now, uh, we know back about 17 years ago, one of the first developmental neuroimaging studies showed that areas of the brain in children with ADHD who had been followed and scanned every few years for about 10 years. So it's a terrific study. Uh, especially for that time. And it was looking at the surface of the brain, the cortex, the gray matter. And it showed that there was about a three-year lag in the development of the brain, principally up here, as you see, in the forward part of the brain, known as the frontal lobes, particularly the prefrontal area. But notice that there was some delayed maturation at the back part of the brain, which is the visual cortex, particularly the association cortex. So uh, although the authors found that to be a bit puzzling, I think, uh, we'll see later why that's not necessarily the case. All right, so smaller cortical development, more delayed cortical development by adulthood, these brains tend to catch up, and there's very little difference in size in the brains of adults with ADHD versus others. So, but there is a delay in the maturation. Now, just because the brain might catch up eventually in size, particularly in the cortex, doesn't mean that it's wired properly or that it's functioning properly. So here's a picture of the brain. I've carved away part of the right hemisphere so we can look deep inside the brain to see some of the structures we're talking about. Uh, here's your frontal lobe, way up front. It's going to be on your right. Uh, and then deep in the brain, you see it labeled the striatum, which is one part of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia has three parts, which I'll show you in a moment. Basal ganglia is very important, particularly the striatum, because it's involved in inhibition of task irrelevant behavior. So it's kind of controlling off-task behavior to help keep you focused on your goals when the frontal lobe has a goal that it wishes to pursue or that you wish to pursue technically. Uh, this is just a study showing that there is a reduction in size in the parts of the basal ganglia. They are the caudate, the putamen, uh, the globus pallidus. Uh, and you can see here that these areas of the basal ganglia, as well as the striatum, which is not shown here, are smaller. The more blue the structure, 
the smaller it tends to be. And so what you're seeing here is a comparison of people with ADHD versus typical people, and we can compute the difference in size, and it's principally in smaller areas. So uh, again, we're seeing smaller brain volumes at the cortex and deep inside at the striatum and the basal ganglia. Now, another structure that's involved here in these studies is the back part of the brain where we have what is called the default mode network. Well known because this is the part of the brain that activates mind wandering when you're not engaged in any particular goal directed or task oriented behavior. So it tends to be the back part of the brain where mind wandering occurs, but there's a connection of that brain forward to the very frontal pole right there behind the nose uh, of, the, of the brain. And that is because the executive brain is gonna use this network to reach back and turn off the mind wandering part of the brain so we can concentrate on what we're supposed to be doing instead of having our mind flitting from one thing to another like we might be doing if we were sitting in the office of our physician waiting for our appointment and we got nothing to do so we start mind wandering, okay? So those are the parts of the brain that we're gonna be talking about. Now, let me just bring that back up here. I wanna go back to this part of the brain. Okay, these studies found the following that there was too much functional connectivity between the sensory motor part of the brain, which is the central part right here in the central part of the brain. So let me see if I can color it in. Okay, um, whoops, that didn't work. Let's back up and try that again. I was hoping to use the highlighter there, but it didn't want me to do that. Let's see if we can get that highlighter up again. There we go, let's uh, use the color yellow. We're talking about right in here, sensory motor part of the brain. There's too much connectivity going back into this striatum and the basal ganglia. They also found that there was too much activity between the back part of the brain, particularly here at the occipital cortex. And again, going into the striatum and basal ganglia, as well as other parts of the brain. So there's too much connectedness here. Now don't confuse that with brain volume. You can have small volumes, but too much interaction, too much connectivity going on, where when one part of the brain is active, it's activating another part of the brain. And what we're seeing here is that this is abnormal connectivity these areas shouldn't be communicating this much with each other, but they are in people with ADHD. Both studies found this in somewhat different parts of the brain. Both found that it did involve this striatum especially, and both conclude that this is correlated with degree of ADHD and that the link of the back part, the visual part of the brain, into the striatum, that over-connectivity, over-functionality, might be the result of visual distractibility in people with ADHD, because what you're seeing here is a striatum is not able to inhibit the activity coming in from the visual cortex, and therefore it's tending to govern behavior. All of this fits very nicely with the view that I've argued earlier in some of my other videos about working memory and the ADHD being a performance disorder, in that People with ADHD are finding that the environment around them in the now, in the moment, is overpowering their goals, plans, and other mental representations about what they're supposed to be doing. In typical people, those mental representations about plans, goals, rules, things they're supposed to be doing, tend to be more powerful than the environment in guiding our behavior over time, kind of like a GPS guides us in our car toward our destination. And so therefore the environment is too powerful. The word in psychology is people with ADHD are field dependent, meaning they're too dependent on what's happening around them and not independent of that environment. So some very interesting studies there, both showing that despite this delay in brain development, despite findings of some smaller areas in the brain, there may be too much interaction between these areas despite these changes in volume. So too much functional connectivity. Okay, I've beaten that dead horse. Let's, uh, let's get out of here. 
okay? And let's go on to two other studies. We're, we're just not gonna bother saving that at the moment. All right, so the two studies showed problems with connectivity and functionality in the brain, yet more evidence that ADHD is a neurologically based problem or disorder, if you will. Okay, onward to our fourth or third study, rather. This is a very important study as well, although it duplicates at least 20 earlier studies, longitudinal studies of people with ADHD. This published over in the Journal of Adolescent Health, done by colleagues up at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Med School, particularly my friend Tim Willens is one of the authors here. Uh, and this is a study that followed nearly 12,000 U.S. 12th grade students over the next six years, looking at their use of drugs, particularly their propensity to use stimulant medication. And it's going to compare those 12th graders who were taking prescribed stimulant medication for ADHD versus those students who didn't take any medication. And they're gonna look at follow-up at how much did they use stimulants and other drugs illegally, without prescription. So it's non-medical, non-prescribed stimulant use. What they're trying to answer here is that age-old question, does taking stimulants during childhood or adolescence predispose people to later stimulant use and abuse? And the long and the short of it is, once again, relative to all the other research, this one also finds that there is no increased risk in later stimulant use, non, that is non-prescribed use, from having taken a prescribed stimulant in adolescence. Now, I have a video on this earlier if you want to take a look at it, but this is just another study that fits in with that topic as well. So, But a very large, very good study that was done. Finally, we're going to wrap it up with a very small study out of the Asian Journal of Psychiatry, this one on the effect of acute aerobic exercise on adults with ADHD, specifically looking at their inhibition or inhibitory control. And what these authors found, this study was done over in China, uh, is that different degrees of, of aerobic activity did have a beneficial effect on helping to increase inhibitory control. And it was primarily in the group that engaged in moderate or high intensity aerobic exercise versus when they didn't engage in exercise or just low intensity exercise. So this fits in with the video I did earlier on this channel on the benefits of exercise for helping people with ADHD. Keep in mind this is only an acute study, so they looked at the changes in inhibitory control before and after one session of aerobic activity, but it supports the other studies that are out there in showing there does seem to be some beneficial effects, small, but helpful. Um, okay, so that's our wrap up for this week. I hope you found this informative. I uh, hope you like my bright yellow shirt because I'm leaving here right now to go to the golf course, right? Uh, and I uh, just wanted to brighten up your day with this, uh, this yellow color. So thanks for joining me, everybody. If you're not a subscriber, as always, I invite you to subscribe. Recommend us to others if you think they'd find this content to be informative for them as well. And thank you to all of you who are subscribing to this channel. We are nearing 77,000 subscribers and approaching 2 million views. That in less than a year. I am thrilled that so many people are interested in science-based information about ADHD. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great week. I'll be back with another commentary later this week. But in the meantime, enjoy your week. Take care. And by the way, happy St. Patrick's Day from last weekend. Be well.